In the early hours of April the 9th, 1955, a plane crashed into the side of a remote mountain near the border of Queensland and New South Wales. It was a bomber on a mercy flight from Townsville to Brisbane, carrying a two-day-old baby that had fallen ill and desperately needed a blood transfusion. I had come to the base of Mount Superbus, southern Queensland's highest mountain, to see what remains of this terrible tragedy. The trailhead for the climb to the wreckage lies at the end of Emu Creek Road, which is scarcely more than a track for most of its length. The road crosses its namesake several times, providing an opportunity for an enjoyable spot of four-wheel driving on the way there. The trail to the wreckage is lightly trafficked and heavily overgrown, but fortunately some thoughtful bushwalkers had recently left markers along the trail, making navigation fairly easy. Logging of the former rainforests in this area in the late 19th and early 20th centuries has significantly changed the landscape, and eucalyptus trees now dominate the lower reaches of the mountain. Purple blooms of milk thistles littered the first section of the track, often hiding the stinging nettles that lay between them. Not only are these plants noxious weeds, they can make a hike in shorts extremely uncomfortable. My legs felt like they were on fire after every swift brush past one of these plants, and at one point the pain became so intolerable that I almost turned back. However, I refused to let my own lack of forethought get the better of me, and I pushed on. As the trail progressed further, the initial unpleasantness of the weed-laden scrub slowly turned into beautiful, ancient rainforest, the last remnant of an ecosystem that once extended much further beyond the mountain. Ferns dominate the floor of the forest as vines create frequent obstacles. Enormous strangler figs can be seen as they slowly envelop their hosts, killing them from the outside in. A very wet start to spring had turned much of the path into a boggy mess, and with so much mud about it was often difficult to keep my footing. Despite this, a wet rainforest retains a sublime beauty unique in its character, and I found that the further I progressed, the more uplifting the walk became.
After four kilometres of walking, I had found the first sign of the wreckage. I didn't know what it was, but I knew what it meant. I was getting closer to the bomber. The track became much steeper after this initial discovery. An enjoyable trollop through the rainforest quickly turned into an arduous, almost vertical climb. Shortly after, I found a very distinguishable piece of the puzzle. One of the aircraft's massive 27-litre Merlin V12 engines lay wedged against a boulder in a gully, its mighty roar long silenced. The cylinders had become entrapments for small puddles of water, a quiet juxtaposition with their original purpose of containing explosions that created the energy required to move a 20-ton plane through the air. Strange mushrooms grew in the soil as I climbed further toward the wreck. Their appearance was deathly, seemingly coloured as a warning not to touch them or else risk severe illness. It was almost as if they were a sign, nature's way of suggesting an environment that was full of danger. The wreckage of the bomber lay strewn across the mountainside, as morbidly impressive as it is mortifyingly tragic. Mangled bits of fuselage jut out of the dirt, half buried and in slow decay. With the air crew hampered by poor weather, defective navigational instruments and the onset of fatigue, the plane had lost its way while trying to find Brisbane. Residents of Bell, a town 236 kilometres inland from Brisbane and 170 kilometres northwest of the crash site, had reported hearing the aircraft circling overhead in the early hours of the morning, suggesting the pilots had become confused. At 4.14am, bushwalkers in the region heard an aircraft crash. Shortly afterward, two explosions in quick succession as the fuel tanks detonated violently. It wasn't until several hours later that a bushwalker was able to alert the authorities. The RAAF found the aircraft at 9.23am, five hours and nine minutes after the Lincoln bomber had collided with the solid granite of Mount Superbus. It lay just 60 metres below the summit. The crash had claimed the lives of all six people on board. The pilot of the Lincoln bomber was John Costello, a World War II veteran. He had flown in the Battle of the Atlantic and had fought off a shark as he was waiting to be rescued after being shot down. The co-pilot, Charles Mason, was also a veteran of the war. He himself had pulled a pilot from the burning wreckage of a crash during a battle and had been decorated for bravery. The navigator, John Finlay, had recently received a promotion after completing an advanced navigation course in England. He had received high marks and was well respected as an experienced navigator. Radio operator William Cater was a veteran of the air campaign in New Guinea. The two-day-old baby, Andrea Huxley, was accompanied by nurse Mafalda Gray. Mafalda had resigned from her position at Townsville Hospital the day of the accident in order to take up a new position in New South Wales and had volunteered to accompany the child. She was 26 years old. Tragedies such as these so often come to define the lives of those involved. 
But these people lived and loved, endured heartbreaks and triumphs, and their final act was an act of service. Their selflessness and bravery may have ultimately led to their demise, but on this mountain their spirit lives on. The twisted wreckage of the crash site has become a monument to the fallibility of mankind's desire to help one another, and the ultimate sacrifice that these people paid. Many practical lessons about air safety were learned from this accident, but I felt the most important lesson here is that every action in life should be taken with kindness. Because no matter what you do, no matter who you are, you will be remembered by your deeds and your deeds alone. Never stop trying to be a good person. Life is far too short to live it selfishly. Thank you.